excerpt from Satirical History of Nebraska. New All Too True Blue Alternative State Histories. Time Immemorial. Wind, Dinosaurs, and Indians. The first inhabitants of Nebraska was wind. It never left. The next inhabitants of Nebraska were the Dino Hippuses. They lived around Chimney Rock. The Dino Hippuses used Chimney Rock as a boundary marker, waypoint, and landmark. Then the Indians came from the east and, not being the pickiest of eaters, scarfed up all the Dino Hippuses. They claimed that the Dino Hippuses tasted like chicken. But that's the same thing that Dino Hippuses said about the Indians. After that, seeing that the Indians had gotten rid of the pesky Dino Hippuses, whose sheer mass and halitosis gave them the fantods, the usual suspects moved in, that is to say, the French and the Spanish. They were always doing that, it seems. No sooner would the Indians get settled in an area than a gaggle of metal-headed yahoos and furry-faced fur trappers would come traipsing in with their bellicose and belligerent ways. As you can see from this picture from a family album, the Dino Hippus was kind of like a horse without flesh and guts. Photo of Dino Hippus at his or her 8th grade graduation ceremony made available by Gato Gato. 1846 to 1869, Oregon Trail heyday. From the mid 1840s to the late 1860s, the Oregon Trail was in constant use by those hoeing westward. People traveled the trail prior to 1846 and after 1869, but those years bracketed the trail's heyday. In Nebraska, landmarks along the trail which were eagerly looked for by travelers included Courthouse Rock, Jailhouse Rock, which later became an inspiration to Elvis, and Chimney Rock, which is shown below as seen by weary travelers of that time period. 1854 Kansas-Nebraska Act Territoryhood When the Kansas-Nebraska Act went into effect in 1854, Nebraska was made a territory, a sales territory, that is, for carpetbaggers and swindlers and dandies who thought there was nothing but country bumpkins and gullible yokels out in the Great American Desert, as they called Nebraska at the time. The farmers in Nebraska would have had little recourse for satisfaction after finding they had been bamboozled by these scalawags, if not for their pitchforks and trained attack oxen. 1862 Homestead Act. The Homestead Act, which was passed in 1862, led to increased westward migration throughout the 1860s. It provided free land to those who would build structures on it and work it for five years. This collaborative finger painting by Stephen Curry and Burl Ives reflects the zeitgeist of those taking part in these heady times. If you look closely, you can see Casey Jones engineering the train, Abraham Lincoln speechifying, Tom Sawyer chasing Becky Thatcher around the schoolyard, your great-grandfather cultivating turnips, and Red Cloud looking on aghast. 1863. Lincoln chooses Omaha as U.P. Terminus. Speaking of Abraham Lincoln, for whom Abraham Nebraska was named, that rocker of the top hat chose Omaha as the eastern terminus of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1863. Soon, railroad tracks could be seen wherever people looked, and they existed where they didn't look, too. This made the transmigration of souls from the east to the west much more convenient than it had been in previous times. Here's a subliminal advertisement slipped into the leading journals of the day, subtly broaching the possibility of relocating to Nebraska. They mention Iowa in there, too, to make Nebraska seem more appealing by comparison. After all, everybody thought Iowa was Idaho, and most people didn't want to travel clear across the continent just to become spud farmers. 
1879, Standing Bear. The Ponca Man Standing Bear went to court in 1879 in Omaha to clear up confusion regarding the Ponca seeding land of theirs. Advocate of Native American rights Thomas Tibbles, who had served under John Brown, made the situation known via the Omaha Daily Herald, which he edited. Due to his stubbornness in refusing to relocate where the authorities claimed he had agreed to move, Standard Bear and others were arrested. At the crux of the legalities was the belief that Indians were not people. Yes, you read that right. The brouhaha became a federal case, literally. Standard Bear gave a brief but logical speech in court proving that he was indeed a man. The upshot was that through this case, Indians were deemed by the judge to indeed be people. This surprised some at the time, apparently. Here's a man in question. Perhaps the inattentive or unobservant thought he must be a bear rather than a person due to his name. 1883. Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show. William Frederick Cody's Buffalo Bill's Wild West, Rocky Mountain, and Prairie Exhibition kicked off in Omaha in 1883. Cody remained a showman ever after that, living until 1917. Here he is in 1915, still game, even after his horse chawed his hair off, thinking it was a bale of hay. 1899, automobiles built in Omaha. In 1899, Otto Beistorfer and his brothers Gus and Charles became the first of nearly a dozen Omaha car manufacturers, naming their product the Automobile. No joke, you can look it up. They rested on their laurels with the Automobile, though, failing to follow through with a Gusmobile or a Chuckmobile. They did invent the Chuck Wagon, though. The next time you want to look at somebody cross-eyed, View the image on the left with your right eye and vice versa. Take some drama mean first, though, especially if you are a drama queen. 1913. Old Pioneers. Willa Cather, who grew up in Nebraska, published her novel Old Pioneers in 1913. Cather's novel tells the story of the Bergsons, a family of Swedish immigrants on a Nebraska farm at the turn of the 20th century. She refers to them as Swedish because there was nary a sourpuss in the bunch. When the patriarch of the family runs away to join the circus, a la Toby Tyler, his daughter, Alexandra Bergson, sails the farm and moves to Chicago. There she becomes a Cubs fan and forgets all about Nebraska. This lithograph of Cather shows her dreaming up her characters and their daring adventures. They are grown right out, of, right out of her bun. Hair bun, that is. Like serpents from Medusa's logs or a batch of sourdough flapjacks from some starter worn around the neck. The thought of joining the circus is just now germinating in her father's well worn noggin, while she envisions Alexander and their witty city shoplifting at Macy's any time she wants. 1923, one of ours. Willa Cather was at it again in 1923 with those far fetched science fiction novels of hers. This time, it was called One of Ours. This effort of hers won Cather a pull of surprise. This eyebrow razor is about Nebraskan Claude Wheeler. Like old pioneers, it is set around the turn of the 20th century. Wheeler is the son of the town drunk and a ballet dancer. His mother gives him all the beer he wants, so he feels he hasn't made. Father tries to give him ballet lessons, but Claude is afraid the neighborhood fellows will think he's a sissy. So, the stuck-between-two-worlds son Drinks all the beers mother has, forcing her to go on the wagon and sober up. Too fat to dance, ballet at any rate. Claude alienates his father after he rips his tutu all asunder into thunder while trying to get it on for his lesson. Frustrated beyond measure, the father gives up ballet for booze, and his mother takes up her long-neglected ballet slippers. She had been a ballet dancer, too, before becoming the town drunk. So now the roles are reversed. The father is now the town drunk and the mother the ballet dancer. The moral of the story is, don't read books about town drunks and ballet dancers. 
And if you do, pay no attention to them. 1954, In the Water Closet. Omaha Indian Marlon Brando starred in the film In the Water Closet in 1954. The flick contains the immortal line, I coulda, shoulda, woulda been a contender. He was talking about his mayoral candidacy, which his brother put the kibosh on by exposing him as a megalomaniac rather than a public servant. Besides Brando, the movie featured Carl Moldy, Ty Cobb, Rod Stewart, Sally Hemmings, and Eve Arden. The soundtrack was performed by the Berenstain Bears, the chipmunks being otherwise occupied at the time. 1962-1992 Johnny Carson Show Although born in Iowa, Johnny Carson often mentioned that he was a Nebraskan. His family moved there from Iowa in 1933, when he was eight years old. Carson's Tonight Show was one of the most popular shows on late-night TV for three decades, from 1962 to 1992. As Ed McMahon would say, Here's Johnny! 1968, Penny and Rainbow Omaha's old twinkle toes, Fred Astaire, appeared in the 1968 movie Finian's Rainbow, along with Petulant Clark. Finian's Rainbow is about a man who wears a plain tie, but everywhere he goes, people say he is wearing a rainbow tie. Then, when he denies it, they say, pointing at his belly, yes you are, see, there's a paw at the end of it. He then pulls out the pillow that he had stuffed in his shirt and trips the light fantastic. Dances up the storm, that is. The joke is on the jokester. If I could put a video clip of a stair clogging and doing the Hungarian goulash dance, I would. 1982, Springsteen's Nebraska. In 1982, Bruce Springsteen followed up his double album, The River, with the sparse and minimalistic Nebraska. Songs featured on Springsteen's Nebraska album include Johnny Rotten, State Blooper, Reason to Believe, not the Rod Stewart song, and Atlantic Ocean, as well as the title song. Here's Springsteen at a concert in Omaha, telling the crowd that Nebraska is one of his 50 favorite states. 2010, Warren Buffett gives away his dough. In 2010, Omaha native and multi-billionaire Warren Buffett got in touch with his inner Andrew Carnegie and said that he was going to give at least half of his bread, dough, to charity. He didn't say how much, if any, he would give his cousin Jimmy. Perhaps Jimmy already has sufficient quantities of greenback dollars. What with all the parrots he sells at his monster out pet shop? Yes, Warren Buffett is the cousin of Jimmy Buffett as well as Earl Warren, Elizabeth Warren, and Warren Moon. But, aren't we all? In an act of logomorphanthropy, philanthropy shown to rabbits, Buffett renovated the Warren of Fiverr and his friends, the Watership Down Gang. They now have organic carrots year-round, without having to worry about being shotgunned by that old grouch and curmudgeon, Farmer McGregor. Here's Buffett. Listen to Cousin Jimmy's song, A Pirate Looks at Eighty. If he would put a parrot on his shoulder, the family resemblance with Jimmy would be more obvious to see. Hey, no jokes about Long John Silver here. 